Hi again, everybody. We're going to talk about some of the surgical implications in the lung, and primarily here we're going to be talking about lung cancer. So most surgery involving the lung is performed in the management of cancer, and I say most surgery as in most surgery in the United States. Tuberculosis, not very common in the U.S. So most surgery involving the lung is in the management of cancer. Uh, and this can be to remove a primary tumor, it can be uh, to remove uh, the, the tissue surrounding it, or uh, possibly an entire hemisection of the lung. Um, and then al also we do uh, surgery in the lung uh, or around the lung uh, to remove nodes when we're uh, doing our workup to determine how much the cancer, if it's present, has spread. Often, initially, uh, cancer of the lung is picked up coincidentally, if there's no symptoms, as a coin lesion, or more formally referred to as uh, a solitary pulmonary lesion. So in this talk, we're just going to go over a, a, just a brief review of the anatomy that's implicated, and then the lung cancers and uh, their types and etiology and behavior, and then what we do when we think it's cancer, just to do the workup and make the diagnosis. And then uh, we'll also talk about some types of lung procedures. We'll sort of talk about these as we go, but uh, towards the end, I'll uh, kind of delve into what these are in detail, not necessarily because it's important for the USMLE, but so you kind of have an idea of uh, why these procedures are done for the exact reasons that they're done. Uh, of course, like anything in surgery, you don't need to know how procedures are done. But often it's, it's nice to, to be able to visualize what you're doing because it kind of tells you why, it's, uh, why you would do that procedure. And for the USMLE, you do need to know why you would do a procedure or what procedure needs to be done. And then I'll also talk about uh, the chemotherapeutic and surgical treatment protocols. But for the chemotherapy stuff, radiation, I talk about that more in the, uh, in the internal medicine pulmonary section on lung cancer, which I strongly advise you to look at if uh, you have it. Okay, so here's your anatomy of the lung. Remember on the right side, we've got three lobes. On the left side, you have two. You've got a trachea that comes down from your, uh, your mouth, for lack of a better word. It uh, breaks into the left main or primary bronchus and the right primary bronchus. And then at the level of the lobes, they, uh, the main stem bronchi split up into uh, lobar bronchi. Uh, and then at the level of the segments, which aren't uh, differentiated here, they split up into the segmental bronchi, which is also the tertiary bronchi. So you don't need to know a whole lot of anatomy for this. So here's a, a normal chest x-ray, just to uh, point this out. I might come back to it later. But uh, note that you've got a trachea that's not deviated to one side or another. If you go down, you don't see any breakage of the rib bones or of the clavicles. Uh, you also see a normal heart silhouette. You see a normal heart shape, normal shape to the aorta. And you've got normal pulmonary markings. So lung cancer is primarily a disease of smokers. Smoking is by far the number one etiology and really the only known etiology of lung cancer that we know of so far. Men have a tendency to get this more than women, not just because men tend to smoke more than women, but also because men just have a tendency to get lung cancer more than women because of their genetics. We don't really know why. Um, Lung cancer is the number two cancer overall in both genders in the United States. So in men, the number one cancer overall is, uh, is prostate cancer, and in women, the number one cancer overall is breast cancer. But lung cancer is a big killer. It's, lung cancer is the number one cause of cancer death in both genders. So even though breast cancer or prostate cancer may be more common, you're more likely to die of lung cancer. 95% of lung cancer patients are over the age of 45, and that has to do with the fact that you have to have, it, it's, you, you gotta have a considerable amount of exposure to smoke uh, to get lung cancer. I suppose you don't have to, but it, you usually have a lot of exposure. You don't get lung cancer from two cigarettes. Um, as I mentioned, there's really no known environmental cause. Asbestos and radon are commonly implicated. 
Uh, however, there's really no known environmental cause that's been demonstrably proven to be associated with lung cancer. The symptoms of lung cancer, like I said, usually uh, it's diagnosed just on a routine x-ray, but there can be symptoms, and when there are, it's usually late in the course. And these, uh, from least specific to most specific, are productive cough, dyspnea, chest pain, wheezing, fever, weight loss, bone pain, which would show spread to the bones, and perineoplastic syndrome, which would be Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome and uh, hypercalcemia and symptoms related to hypercalcemia. The type of cancer can only be diagnosed by biopsy. So you see these different types of cancer here. You can't diagnose that just on chest x-ray or CT alone. Uh, however, having the chest x-ray and CT, which you need to have, uh, are helpful to determine whether the tumor is central or peripherally located. And you need to know that to decide what surgical procedure you're going to use to get your biopsy. So the central cancers are small cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And I like to remember that just by remembering small cell and squamous cell are central. So you've got that S on there. And then your peripheral cancers include uh, adenocarcinoma, large cell carcinoma, and undifferentiated carcinoma. Now, a surgeon will want to divide these up by central and peripheral because that helps them decide what surgical technique they're going to do uh, to get a biopsy. But your uh, pathologist is going, or your not necessarily your pathologist, but uh, your, uh, your uh, hematologist or uh, your oncologist would want to differentiate these by small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer because small cell lung cancer has a totally different uh, treatment protocol than the non-small cell lung cancers. So that's just uh, you see that if there's small cell lung cancer and you may also see non-small cell lung cancer, that's just referring to all the rest. But remember, small and squamous are central and the rest are peripheral. That's really important to know. So some things to note in the various lung cancer types. I'm not going to go over these in too much detail, but with small cell lung cancer, it's almost exclusively in smokers. If you look at that graph here, look at the non-smoker part. Very, very few. Uh, this is a bad prognosis. It's usually not diagnosed until late in uh, stage, and it spreads lymphatic and vascular. Uh, and this is a central cancer. Squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, on the other hand, has a slow growth and late metastases. This has a little bit better prognosis. Uh, on imaging, particularly in squamous cell carcinoma, you can note central necrosis, but that's not specific to squamous cell carcinoma. Adenocarcinoma of the lung is uh, a few things make it distinct. One, it's the most common lung cancer overall. So as a share of all the lung cancers, adenocarcinoma takes up the most. It's also uh, more common in women. So uh, remember that lung cancer is more common in men than women, but adenocarcinoma, that's different. That's particular cancer is more common in women than in men. And the big thing here is that this is the lung cancer that's most likely to occur in non-smokers. It's not more likely to occur in non-smokers than smokers. It's the one that if a non-smoker gets lung cancer, this is the one that they're most likely to get. And that comes up on the USMLE from time to time. They may just give you a vignette that da 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 has lung cancer, they're a non-smoker, they've never smoked in their life, which of the following is the most likely tumor type, most likely cancer type that they've got. And adenocarcinoma is the most common, com the most common lung cancer in non-smokers, and that's a good one to know, really good to know. Uh, large cell carcinoma and undifferentiated carcinoma are much less common. They make up only uh, like less than 5 to 10% of all the lung cancers. Uh, but the big thing with these is that they've got a really bad, uh, really, really bad prognosis. Really all lung cancers have bad prognoses compared to other cancers, but uh, 
large cell uh, and undifferentiated carcinoma have the worst. So compared to that normal x-ray now, you can see with this x-ray, and you can't see as many pulmonary markings here on the left as you can on the right. That may just be due to the, uh, the settings of the x-ray. But what you can note here is your solitary pulmonary nodule right here, and also you've got one right here. So these are two solitary pulmonary nodules. Patient may have had symptoms, maybe they didn't have symptoms. We're gonna come back to this and I'm gonna show you uh, why one of these patients may have more likely had symptoms uh, than the other one. But it's possible that neither of these patients had symptoms and that these were picked up just by chance. So when you see a solitary pulmonary nodule, which is just a coin lesion, just a nodule in the lungs with really nothing else, uh, there's many things that it could possibly be. We're primarily going to talk about benign nodules and lung cancer, but uh, apart from those, you can have a hamartoma, and that's going to be more likely to happen in a non-smoker. And these are asymptomatic, and if you were to do a CT, you would have you would see a popcorn ball-like appearance. So we're not going to talk about this in detail. I talk about it in the uh, in the lung tumor section. Uh, back in the med uh, medical section. And then uh, with granuloma, it's similar to hamartoma in that it happens in a non-smoker and is asymptomatic, but th this has a bullseye nodule appearance on CT. So those are some nodules that you can see that aren't benign or, I mean, they're, they're benign, but they're not cancer related. And then tuberculosis is another thing that can cause what looks like a solitary pulmonary nodule. Tuberculosis is tremendously uncommon in the United States, but when you do uh, have pulmonary tuberculosis, it's usually in an immigrant or somebody who's got known exposure or perhaps somebody who uh, has had a positive PPD test or is, Im and is immunocompromised. Uh, usually this is going to be less than two centimeters. You'll have some calcification here. And sometimes in tuberculosis, you can also see the miliary pattern. Uh, patients who are severely immunocompromised, particularly HIV with a low CD4 count, usually around less than 100, 150, um, they can have mycobacterium avio complex or other fungal infections, and this can also appear as a pulmonary nodule, except these tend to occur in multiple sites. Now with the benign nodule, which is just a nodule for no apparent reason, or lung cancer. With the benign nodule, you have a particular set of findings that are more common than with the uh, findings that you see in lung cancer. And this is both based on the history of the patient, uh, possibly the physical, and what you see on chest x-ray. So let's uh, talk about this in a little bit more detail. So often patients with lung cancer don't have symptoms, and this is just coincidentally picked up. So sometimes you won't have symptoms to work with. The best first step is to always review previous chest x-rays if, if, if available. So if a patient has a solitary pulmonary nodule, you wanna see, is this a nodule that's been around for a long time? Because if a nodule has been sitting around in a patient who's 55 years old, for instance, and it's been in them since they were 30, what do you think the odds are of them having cancer? Nothing, because you don't get lung cancer and survive for 25 years, or even really five for that matter without treatment. So uh, the rule is uh, you wanna get a previous chest x-ray and if you have a chest x-ray that shows a lesion that looks the same uh, or no significant change and that x-ray was more than two years ago, that excludes the need for surgical biopsy. Basically the patient doesn't have lung cancer. If the, uh, the nodule on chest x-ray appears concentric, or if there's heavy calcification, if there's smooth margins, if it's dense, that really points towards a benign nodule. And generally, this excludes the need for surgical biopsy. However, there are some things that would make me want to lean towards possibly getting a biopsy, and that would be if the lesion was more than one centimeter. So the, the lesion size correlates to the risk of malignancy. Most benign nodules are going to be less than one centimeter. 
So if, if the nodule is less than one centimeter, uh, that it's, it's highly unlikely that it's, uh, that, that it's cancerous. And then also if the patient is 35 uh, years old or less, very unlikely that, uh, that the, the lesion is cancerous. Now, if the need for a surgical biopsy cannot be ruled out, then uh, you're going to need to obtain a CT, if you haven't already, to determine whether this mass is central or peripheral in location. And then at that point, you're going to be getting your biopsy. Because we need a biopsy to determine what type of cancer this is, if it is cancer. So we're going to be obtaining a biopsy if uh, we can't rule out a benign pulmonary nodule. And if it's a central lesion, and this is why this is so important to know central versus peripheral, if it's a central lesion, the next step is bronchoscopy, flexible bronchoscopy to get your biopsy. And if it's a peripheral lesion, we're going to get a percutaneous needle biopsy. And this kind of makes sense because if it's central, if it's closer to the bronchi, then we go in to the bronchus directly and we can grab the, uh, the sample right there. If it's peripheral, meaning further out towards the alveoli, then we're going to need to go in from, from the outside and that's done with a needle. So central, which is small and squamous cell, and peripheral, which is adenocarcinoma and uh, undifferentiated large cell carcinoma. Okay, uh, now once you get the biopsy, then if it reveals cancer, you're going to assess for spread. And this is done to help with staging. You don't need to know how to stage lung cancer, but you do need to know that you get a PET scan once you have diagnosed cancer, and then you get a mediastinoscopy, and that's done to get a biopsy for the lymph nodes. With a mediastinoscopy, you're just going in, just, just, like, uh, just like any, uh, like if you were to get uh, a uh, laparoscopy, uh, you're just going in with cameras and you're taking out a lymph node. And finally, the treatment is going to be based on the degree of spread, which is your staging and grading, and the histologic type of cancer. So here's your solitary pulmonary nodule and your solitary pulmonary nodule here. Uh, I want you to guess which one is the benign one and which one's the malignant one. And you might be able to guess that the one here on the right is malignant and the one here on the left is benign. And some things that you can also notice, and I can't, I didn't read the histology or didn't read the radiologist report and I am far from a radiologist. Um, but some things you could note here are some, some possible uh, lymph node spreads here on the, on the right. You see one, two, three, four. And also you got what might be increased pulmonary markings, but I can't say that for certain. But definitely you can see some possible lymph nodes here that might, be, uh, might have metastases. So this one here is the malignant one. All right. So this is just a little diagram that helps me remember uh, how to do this workup, and uh, this kind of puts it into visual form, if you like to learn that way. So uh, the solitary pulmonary nodule, when you see it, the first thing to do is get a history, the symptoms, old chest x-rays. Uh, remember to keep in mind your history and symptoms. If the patient's a non-smoker, far less likely they've got cancer. If the patient's been smoking, 20, 30, 40 pack years, more likely. Symptoms, if they don't have any, maybe a little less likely. Some, uh, if they've got uh, bone pain and they're cachectic, way more likely. So you get your old chest x-rays, history, symptoms, etc. If the uh, if it's clearly benign, meaning you've got uh, old chest x-rays that show a uh, similar nodule, uh, then you can do a follow-up. Uh, if anything, uh, if uh, when you if it's if it's clearly malignant, then you should go ahead with a CT. Uh, if it's questionable, then you really have to ask yourself based on history and symptoms. So, not a smoker, no symptoms. Maybe we can do a follow up. If they are a smoker and maybe they've had some symptoms, then then you should probably go forth with uh, with your bronchoscopy. Uh, or FNA. So once you've done this CT, uh, 
you want to know if it's central or peripheral. If it's central, you're going to get a flexible bronchoscopy. If it's peripheral, you're going to get a, an FNA or a percutaneous needle biopsy. And uh, FNA and percutaneous needle biopsy are both done, uh, but percutaneous needle biopsy has been shown, especially recently, to be a, uh, a more accurate a more accurate test. So uh, I would go with percutaneous needle biopsy, but I wouldn't expect you to be asked to choose between the two of these. Um, so then at that point, you get your biopsy. If it's negative, it's benign, and that ends what you need to do. If it's malignant, then you need to assess for treatment. That's done via PET scan and uh, looking at the nodes. And I should add, in addition to a mediastinoscopy, you can also get uh, an FNA of your, your nodes. Ah, and that's right here. Okay. So some other tests, surgical uh, tests uh, or procedures that can be done. So uh, sometimes a, a patient, their initial presentation with lung cancer is uh, a, a, a pleural effusion. Uh, and so uh, you can do, for these patients, you'd want to do a thorough synthesis, obviously, but uh, in any patient who's got a history that's suspicious for lung cancer, you're also going to want to get a cytology. And I think most of the time you get a thorough synthesis, you always send it to cytology. So this should always be performed if there's an effusion. And that's both for therapeutic reasons and for diagnostic reasons. The video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery it uh, may be performed per, for peripheral lesions to get uh, a, a, um, a biopsy if your FNA or your percutaneous needle biopsy are unsuccessful. So this is sort of a second, uh, uh, a second line uh, diagnostic intervention. Um, it mostly second line because uh, it's a little bit more invasive. Now the sputum sample is not a surgical, uh, a surgical test, and I don't imagine it would ever come up on the USMLE, but it is done in real life. Uh, this can be performed if the chest x-ray or CT suggests a central lesion, and the reason is because a sputum sample can sometimes show you if the patient has squamous cell lung cancer, uh, but it really is not useful for any of the other cancers. And furthermore, a negative result doesn't always mean that the patient doesn't have squamous cell lung cancer. So basically, uh, this is kind of like a pap smear of the lungs. What you're doing is you're, uh, you're, you're cough, having the patient cough, getting their sputum, and then you're looking for malignant cells. The malignant cells might not be there, uh, and that might be because you got a bad sputum sample. But if the malignant cells are there, you certainly do have squamous cell carcinoma because you don't just get malignant cells from nowhere. So I don't know if the sputum sample uh, is going to come up on the USMLE, but I would just be aware of it. And then the fine needle aspiration of lymph node, this is performed, uh, can be performed in place of mediastinoscopy uh, if, uh, if you've got a, um, uh, a patient who has contraindications to surgery or might not be a, a good candidate for surgery. You can, you can do it this way too. So a big question is whether or not you can operate. And that doesn't just go for, that's not really going for the uh, diagnosis uh, part, but more for the, uh, the, the surgical treatment. So the surgical treatment for lung cancer and the lung cancers you can surgically treat is a pulmonary resection. And this can be done in various degrees. It can be done as a wedge resection where you're just taking out the tumor and part of the surrounding uh, tissue. It can be done as a lobectomy or a, uh, I think they call it a radical lobectomy where they take out more than a lobe, uh, but that's just uh, removing a, an entire lobe or a slightly more than a lobe. And then a pneumonectomy, which is removing an entire lung. And you don't need to know which of these to do. Just know that pulmonary resection is done to treat uh, certain lung cancers. Um, and this is determined based on how much it's spread. Now, there are contraindications for resection, and uh, those contraindications, number one, include poor pulmonary function. So a lot of people who are smokers have poor pulmonary function as a result of their smoking, not as from their cancer. Uh, but the rule of thumb, and I talk about this in greater detail in the pulmonary section, 
Uh, but the rule of thumb is roughly if the patient has a force vital capacity of 1.5 liters or less, you can't resect. Uh, but it's really going to depend on how much you need to take out. Some other contraindications for resection are distant metastases or advanced cancer. We're not going to do surgery there. Uh, if the patient has a malignant pleural effusion, not going to do surgery there. If the patient has a nerve palsy, and usually we see this as uh, in the phrenic nerve or the recurrent laryngeal nerve, not going to do surgery there. Um, or uh, if they have uh, superior vena cava syndrome. I would say that uh, these last three are more relative contraindications, um, but these top two are, are, are pretty much uh, absolute contraindications. Definitely no the poor pulmonary function one. You can't remove, it, 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 if we're trying to cure the patient, if we're trying to treat the patient, you can't remove lung if they don't have enough lung to give. So that's pretty obvious. <laughs> okay. So this medical treatment here uh, and surgical treatment, uh, if it, you have to know what cancer the patient has first off. If the patient has a central lung cancer, we don't do surgery at all. We just do chemotherapy and maybe radiation. If the patient has a peripheral lung cancer, that's when we do surgery. So based on the patient's stage, that's going to help you determine if you can do surgery and then also based on their pulmonary function. So the lower staged uh, cancers, you can do surgery. If it's advanced 3B and 4, you can't do surgery uh, because it's spread too much. So stage 0, 1, 2, and 3A, you can do surgery. And when I say you can do surgery, I mean it's possible to do surgery, but you still have to know what their pulmonary function is. You can still rule out surgery if they've got bad pulmonary function. So surgery for adenocarcinoma and then the large cell uh, carcinoma. Uh, and if it's one, you do radiation in addition to the surgery. If it's two or three A, you do radiation and chemo in addition to the surgery. For uh, just as far as the chemotherapy, what kind do we use? With the small cell lung cancer, we use uh, a platinum agent carboplatin, and uh, etoposide. With everything else, we use the CAP chemotherapy, which is uh, cyclophosphamide, adriamycin, and a platinum agent, usually uh, cisplatin or carboplatin. All right, so again, I go way into, into more detail uh, with the, in, the, in the pulmonary section. I'm just kind of glossing over this. All right, so some surgical procedures. So this is a flexible bronchoscopy. You can see it looks in many ways similar to, uh, uh, to an upper endoscope or a lower endoscope, some similarities. And uh, now that we've got all these fiber optic technologies, uh, we can go in and look with a video and take pictures, which is really nice. So you can see here, uh, this is the uh, separation at uh, where the right and left uh, main stem bronchi come off. And this is how we do biopsy for small cell lung cancer and squamous cell lung cancer. The percutaneous needle biopsy is usually done uh, under, uh, under guidance of uh, CT. And uh, so basically you're just, as it sounds, you're sticking in the needle percutaneously. And this is done as biopsy for adenocarcinoma and large cell and undifferentiated. And then a pneumonectomy, this is, I guess I didn't really have to show you a picture of what a pneumonectomy looks like, but I liked this one. This is on the, this is a left-sided pneumonectomy. And what I, what I liked about this is that you can see a lot of anatomy here uh, when the lung is removed. So here's a zygous vein in front of the esophagus. And uh, you can also see here, uh, yeah, okay, so here's your pericardium here and I don't want to give you the wrong names of any of these uh, anatomic uh, landmarks, so I'll probably just shut up. But uh, this is the intercostal vein, so you're looking at the back part of the uh, thoracic cage. So it's kind of cool to see anatomy in a real person that's not a cadaver. Not that cadavers aren't real people, but anyway. Okay, so this is the treatment in peripheral cancers grade 3A or less 
so long as the patient qualifies for surgery, especially that they've got enough lung function. And then here's a pleural synthesis. So you can do these for many reasons, not just cancer, but a lot of patients with advanced cancer, if it's not being treated or hasn't been treated, they can get malignant pleural effusions. And so the treatment for that is pleurosynthesis. And it's also part of our diagnosis because it's going to help us uh, see if there's any uh, cancerous cells in the, uh, in the effusion. And so this is a pleurosynthesis done. The rest of the patient's covered up for good reason. That's good aseptic technique. Uh, and then, uh, and of course, we want aseptic technique because we're opening up a aseptic cavity. And so the last thing we want to do is introduce bacteria. So you, uh, you can see here what we're doing. We're going into the pleural space and removing some of the fluid. Uh, with a pleural effusion, you'll have lots of fluid, especially in a malignant pleural effusion. And you're just removing fluid and sending it off for analysis. All right, so just to recap, uh, some things that you need to know and some things you really don't need to worry about as much for the test. So what you do need to know is how to tell apart a clearly benign lesion from a clearly malignant lesion on chest x-ray and on CT with help from history. So I would uh, encourage you to go back and look at the medical section where I show some pictures of hamartomas and, uh, and of other nodules, tumors, masses that you can find in the lung, um, just because uh, those are going to be things that the USMLE will expect you to know that I didn't really cover in this section here. Um, so be able to tell apart a clearly benign lesion from a clearly malignant lesion. What you don't need to worry about is distinguishing the histologic type of lung cancer based solely on the biopsy or the description of biopsy. That is stuff for step one and you are reading this you are beyond that so take a deep breath and be happy about that what you do need to know is which tumors need bronchoscopy and which tumors need percutaneous needle biopsy for biopsy and usually you're going to be told that it's a central or peripheral lesion you will never be asked to worry about uh, to look for looking at a chest x-ray and making this determination based on that Maybe you might have to look at a CT and make that determination, whether it's central or peripheral. Um, and so you look, if it's closer to the bronchi, then it's central. If it's further out, then it's peripheral. Uh, but I don't expect that, if that question comes up, um, it's definitely a 99th percentile. Or, um, most of the time you'll be told it's a central appearing lesion, it's a peripheral appearing lesion on CT. It's not a radiology test. Okay, the major contraindications for resection you do need to know. Namely, that's poor pulmonary function as well as advanced stage cancer. What you don't need to worry about so much is how to determine how much lung to resect if you're resecting. What you do need to know is the epidemiologic points of lung cancer. Primarily, it's smokers who get it, usually people in their 60s to 80s, men more than women. Out of the certain cancers, the most common is adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma is the most common in non-smokers. And the ones that are most likely to kill you out of all of them are small cell and large cell or undifferentiated. What you don't need to worry about is how exactly to stage lung cancer. Uh, there are some cancers that you do need to know how to stage for the USMLE. Uh, this isn't one of them. And then uh, what you do need to know is the differential diagnosis of the solitary pulmonary nodule. And I go over that in greater detail in the pulmonary section, which again, I encourage you to look over if you haven't done so yet. And with that, I bid you farewell for now.